I hope you had a chance to look at the um, film and have any questions. We're happy to take those today. Uh, we always see how large the group is that comes each month and then determine whether we uh, go forward with particular you know, questions that people have or whether I kind of blab for a while. Maybe I'll blab for a few minutes um, and just remind you in the movie, we're talking about the two different cycles. They're also, we, I'm starting to talk about them as in more detail as two distinctive pathways. So the cycles are the cycle of competitive detachment, which we're in now where we, we forgot how to meet children's basic needs, especially babies uh, and mothers who are uh, expecting and how to support healthy development in young children who are so immature when they're born, uh, like fetuses of other animals until about 18 months of age. And so we need an external womb experience, which is needs met immediately to keep the growth state going for all the things that are scheduled to grow. Uh, there's sensitive periods that for foundational skills and capacities that if you miss the growth, uh, growth kind of biochemistry, for those systems, the timing goes and you've you've missed it. Now you have a gap in your brain and your capacities that maybe doesn't show up till later when you have, uh, you know, anxiety, depression, uh, and such things in adolescence or adulthood even. So um, meeting the basic needs of the young, which is much more extensive than what Abraham Maslow was talking about. He was talking really about outcomes, the feeling of love and esteem and all well, what does that mean, though? How do you get there? The evolved nest is how you get there. Uh, the evolved nest provides for, it's, it's a buffering system for whatever genes you have, uh, whatever else, uh, even trauma. We find that um, mothers who have a, a higher, we've published on this, uh, a greater um, evolved nest history are able to buffer the effects of adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, on their uh, vagal nerve functioning, which is the vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve, which innervates all major systems of the body. And so it's malfunction is going to give you problems in one system or another. So irritable bowel, uh, asthma, uh, brain seizures, heart problems, if this nerve is not established well in early life. So we find then the evolved nest buffers those negative effects that adversity has on the vagus nerve functioning. So the evolved nest is really key, uh, but when we don't provide it, then we that leads to in the cycle uh, dysregulation of all kinds. So vagus nerve stress response kicks in too easily, too uh, often, and you're in a state of inflammation. Uh, and then that leads to adults who are not very well physically, mentally, socially. Um, they get into the primitive systems of the brain um, functioning. Their, you know, their full potential has not been fostered, cultivated, and so they have to rely on the systems we're, that we're born with that are innate, which are dominance orientations, self-protection orientations. Uh, in order to just feel safe, right? And then you have to grab onto something out there to make you feel safe, some ideology, some gun, some kind of uh, thing outside of yourself because you have this big gap, big hole in your soul. You don't know who you are. You don't feel connected. All along the way, you've been forced into disconnection. And so you don't know how to be present in your body to the earth where you are in this moment and you don't know how to relate right because you miss some of those little micro skills that develop before language develops in early life uh first six years are so important for developing our social and emotional intelligence it's not the time to be pushing reading that's left brain stuff that's the deliberative conscious ego conscious mind that the the Western world has loved for so many centuries and has put us in the pickles we're in where we forgot how to relate and we forgot how to be present to our earth partners, the trees and the animals and plants. So the, the um, cycle of competitive attachment 
undermines early development, leads to dysregulations of all sorts to adults who aren't very well, wise, um, connected, and then they keep the cycle going because they don't know any better, right? They don't know that there's another way to be because the cultural stories are, oh, that's just the way humans are. You're selfish and aggressive and you can't, unpredictable. And well, you created that, right? Because you forgot the wellness informed pathway. You forgot the cycle of cooperative companionship, which is the cycle of our ancestors, all our ancestors. Just uh, most everybody until a few hundred years ago followed the path. Now it's been degraded since civilization for the last 5,000, 10,000 years, little by little, the evolved nest has been, has deteriorated from force, from coercion, from hierarchy, pushing people into things that are not um, unfolding from inside. So we're, we're scheduled as, I mean, we're like all animals, we unfold our beauty, our virtue, our wonder, our uniqueness unfolds when we have the support system of the evolved nest, what, whatever animal you are. And when we don't have that, then we're, and we don't in civilization, we're, we force children to do th this or that. And we think we have an idea of what's best for them. Uh, and we don't pay attention to their inner beauty and how, or understand how it unfolds from support systems, not from teaching adults, teaching them how to do things. They observe and learn it by doing. And so, um, the cycle of cooperative companionship then is providing all the supports, all the nine components we've identified. There's more we could put on the list, but those are the ones we've looked at in our lab. And uh, those things then provide that buffer, that em embrace of love, a biology of love, so that the unfolding, the normal way of, of growing your neurobiological systems and your social capacities and your intelligences of all kinds then grow uh, naturally. We, you know, evolution doesn't make mistakes. It's culture that makes mistakes. And we've made so many mistakes uh, to forget these things. We need the wise elders who know these things to guide the new parents. New parents aren't very good at being parents, typically, especially in our era because they haven't seen how to raise a, a child well, how to nurture them without force, for example. So when you provide the, the evolved nest, you're gonna have a well-functioning neurobiology and social emotional intelligence. And the, those uh, features, those capacities then grow into an adulthood of well-being, uh, of good health and happiness and joy, joyful relations and flexibility and attunement to others. And then those adults create the culture or society or community that keeps the cycle going. So those are the two pieces in the movie that I've just gone through quickly. And um, they really, uh, well, Maybe I'll stop and see if there are questions or comments or you want more information. And you can raise your hand with, or, um, and then I'll call on you or you can write in the chat, I think as well. See if I can get the chat. So Lisa's starting to put things in the, in the chat. Hi, the link Darsha. to the study you're okay. referring to, Darsha, with yeah. the aces in the evolved nest. That's in there. Yes, and who spoke? I have a question. Yes. Malin? Hi. Huh? Yes. Hi, Malin. Uh, so I'm out walking, getting at the nature component. Uh, yeah, I'm so grateful for your work. It's uh, It resonates so much with me uh, uh, and I feel it's very timely too, uh, seeing so much polarization and, and the wars going on. And yeah, the importance that we find, uh, 
find that attachment in ourselves, even if we didn't get it and, and, uh, and see the world. Yeah. Like you're saying that it's not that people are, are bad or evil or yeah, we're just traumatized. Yeah. And especially from, from the parenting and the lack of village. Um, so uh, yeah, I really hope, uh, yeah, I like to be part of spreading this um, understanding more, but I, I may be curious about if you see an example, can, can we, or to what extent can we re-village and re-parent ourselves or, you know, even if we are in a, in a dysfunctional system, but yeah, do you have examples or how, how do you do it in your life or how, or, or people around you? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. And yeah, thank you so much again. Thank you, Malin. Good to have you. Where are you from? Where are you? Uh, yeah, I'm from Sweden, but I live in, in Nelson, uh, Sinaix land. It's in uh, British Columbia, Canada. Uh -huh. uh, nice. Yeah. All right. Well, good questions, of course. Uh, the the uh, big puzzle is how to get back to our heritages that foster well-being for, for humans and for the planet. Uh, and that's uh, massive changes have to be done, of course, overall. I always um, suggest that you start with yourself, right, to be present to the moment where you are and to let go of your fear and let love flow in and let the divine energies of the, the universe come in. And then you spread that through your being just where you are. We can all do that. Uh, it may take a little more time if you've been traumatized to let go of the trauma. We kind of build up all sorts of um, protections when we've been traumatized in different ways. And so sometimes taking off those band-aids or uh barriers is painful but once you've done that it, you feel much more alive and much happier uh to be in the moment so um i always encourage starting with yourself now the system of course has to be changed if you're a family uh, with children uh, or going to have children you almost have to create your own village now uh it depends on where you live in the world um in the United States, it's very hard for families to find the support systems they need. Uh, the privileged people who have uh, uh, income of one one uh, job that can bring in a, enough income to support a family, I recommend you know just slowing down, uh, sharing jobs, or uh, you know giving up the job for a few years in those early years of life when the child really is shaped by their experiences moment to moment, day to day, week by week, it's really important for them to feel um, supported. And you don't want to just have mother doing that because that's not what we evolved to need either. It's not a one-on-one -on -one, uh, nurturing. It needs to be a community of nurturers. So that's where you want the father, of course, involved and neighbors, uh, extended family members. People are going to be responsive to that child and pay attention to who they are and know them, learn to know their quirks and their interests and get them to laugh. Those are the people you want caring for your child. So these are challenges in the States in particular. It's pretty difficult to uh, find ways to support um, your children as a parent. But I think we could just have to start to imagine it differently. We we get stuck thinking this is all there is, this is the best we can do. But if we have examples of alternatives, we can now start to change. So if you're in a religious community, a church community, or for example, you could perhaps uh, find a way to uh, bring together families at least once a week to be together and feel supported, let the children play, do your laundry together, make the meals for the week, things like that. Now, the bigger system has to be changed as well. We are focused on money, money making uh, at the expense of everything else on the planet. So we have to get our politicians to be responsive to 
human needs and not the needs of money, money makers. <clears throat> and that's a whole nother ball game. Um, so we're focused here on the interpersonal aspects and what's really needed for that child to grow optimally. Um, and we'll take ideas from everybody for how to make changes. Hi, Darsha. Um, yeah. Tom Niebuhr has his hand up. Okay, hang on a second. Um, I just was spoke at the uh, Local Futures uh, Summit in Bristol, England. And uh, that's a focus all over the world on localizing um, life again. So growing your own food, um, just getting what you need from the local community rather than transporting or buying apples that are from New Zealand, for example, or something like that. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so localization. So localfutures.org is a place to go. And there are people all over the world now trying to restructure their local communities so that you are based in um, not waste, not putting carbon in the air, not paying middlemen, all that stuff um, to bring back our sense of sustainability and how we can take care of ourselves. Okay, Tom. Yes, thank you. Um, I got wind of your work through Gabriel Crom, who I've been doing some study and practice with over time. Uh, and I just finished reading your book, Restoring the Kinship Worldview, which I thought was just excellent. Thank but uh, what I wanted to bring up was I'm a grandfather now. I've got nine grandkids. And I find that a good number of them are immersed in hyper competitive performance uh, oriented uh, events like sports and even dance. Um, and I just think it's taken a toll on them. Um, so I just wanted some feedback about uh, what I can do. Uh, and I, I have been doing some things like when the kids are with my wife and I, um, we focus on play, you know, and we also try to de-emphasize the triumphalism, you know, the win-lose orientation that seems to be so closely associated with this hyper-competitive uh, culture. So anyway, we emphasize, you know, more uh, freelance fun um, and uh, lack of hierarchy. So anyway, just wanted to see what you had to say about any of that. Well, it sounds like you're doing what I would do. <laughs> hmm. Play, yeah. Uh, let the children direct the play. I don't know how old they are. How old are your, the kids? Well, they range. My oldest is uh, 21 and the youngest is six. But I'm focused now more on the younger ones um, mm -hmm. that range anywhere from high school down to, again, age six. Well, one thing that is good about um, competing is is improving your own skills, right? To be whatever that is uh, and to see how far you can go. So it's not so much the winning as the um, self um, growth. And and so there is something good about that. So you could emphasize that aspect. It sounds like you're doing that really. Uh, <clears throat> and then always be the sounding board and always be the place where they can come and they don't have to compete, right? With one another, with you, that's going to be so refreshing for them. They'll come back uh, over the years and and really um, find a way to nestle into that nest. So I think you're doing great. Thank you. John of Bristol. Thank you, Darcia. Please excuse me, everyone. I can't turn my my um, camera on, but I'm I'm here. I'm here with you, nevertheless. Just to d piggyback on what you were saying, Garcia, I also was I was at that wonderful gathering in Bristol that you were referring to. Uh, but, but it was just to say, and my 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 involvement in it um, is has was still is around the very substantial network of people, both individually but also groups, community groups. Uh, local groups of all shapes and sizes growing food 
to some degree or another. Um, aside from anything else, it's just it's just very good for you to be involved in growing food. It just feels really, really good. Of course, it doesn't stop you having to obviously, you know, su supplement that perhaps in the early days because you're not, grow you know, you're not involved in, in growing enough. It's also not about a small scale um, approach as if it is like being a, a, a farmer, a commercial farmer necessarily. Uh, in other words, you don't have to put that kind of, you know, spurting blood into, into producing your food uh, uh, and many of the people I've been involved with do it for uh, various other reasons, including uh, besides just producing food, it generates the most wonderful uh, basket, if you like, of, of relationships, uh, including, of course, children, people of all ages, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It, it, it's a it's a crucial part of, uh, if you like, a, a community. And I don't know what it's like in America. I, I imagine that perhaps in some places, um, you know, that's perhaps going on and people might not even be aware of it happening in the, in the local area. And uh, uh, anyway, I just wanted to throw it in because it's, it's very, very nutritious in far more ways than just the actual food. Yeah, and it's not competitive, really. It's, you know, no, really, like you say, it's relational. Yeah. 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 And nurturing you practice nurturing of the plants uh it responsive to whatever they need uh which is good practice too so that that might be something to try tom if you can <laughs> with the kids and you could be just a plant in the window too if there's no opportunity in the in the yard for example sigurd hello hi there so uh, two connections, as with Tom, Gabriel Cram is the one who pointed out your work to me, and that's how part of how I ended up here. And there are so many parallels to the way he is talking about finding a healthy body and how that happens when the human is raised in an environment where that healthy body can grow as a healthy body rather than be damaged through gestation and early life um i'm also in deep transformation network and a bunch of people there went to that event in bristol and in a post conversation somebody who lived in an urban environment says well it's all well and good for folks who live in the country who can do permaculture and stuff but what do we do in the city and that brought to mind for me um uh something I had not heard about before, which is the, um, what is it called? The social settlement movement. This is from the late 19th century. I found about it. There's a book by Mary Watkins on mutual accompaniment and the creation of the commons. Mm -hmm. And what she's talking about, it, people who went and lived in tenement buildings and cities and formed communities with the people who were there so that families were supporting each other. And that was a way of bringing what you're talking about into a situation where people didn't have that. And I thought that was a, a really interesting uh, way of uh, helping bring that about. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. Uh, Mary Watkins, wonderful uh, work she does. Um, yeah, it, so we can find maybe, um, We'll have to uh, link to those kinds of things that evolve nests so people have some sense of uh, what the options are. Mm. And I'm sure all of us have the creative um, linkages to creativity uh, to come up with ideas that work wherever we are. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Barbara, are you talking to us? Sorry, can I say something uh, real quick? Uh, the mid I did some work at the United Nations, like very small, but like listening to other people talk. The midwife is the community, usually in other cultures, the midwife is the community. So the women come with their babies, they play, they laugh, they sing. Uh, when they're sick, they'll go to the midwife. And so a community birthing center, community doulas, community midwives, 
uh, lactation, having a play place for women just to come. And then you have speakers, like all of these could be places where you touch people. And I know, um, who's that woman in Florida who uh, is, is, is like eliminating. Jenny Joseph. Yeah. She has like, um, you know, Ooh. the women come in community, Jenny, Jenny, Jenny Joseph. So, yeah, the women come into community for their prenatal care. They come to a big room. They they lecture them. Then they ask their questions individually. They talk to each other. They help with their prenatal care. Like they do their own urine. And then after that, they see the doctor individually. But maybe just like talking about how do we build like what it's it's already been. So the Evolved Nest, we have the blueprint for what it is. But with these ideas, we can do it. I had a lady here in New Jersey. She, she got funded completely for community doula program, training women within the community, and they had to give back with three births. And then they could practice on their own. And then it, she was through a nursing program. Someone else came in, eliminated the nursing program. She paid for herself. She paid for everything. She had all the stuff and they got rid of her. But it was such a beautiful and sustainable and it worked and she was getting money and it was building. But uh, for some reason, the powers that be didn't really want it. But that those are ideas. Uh, I also want to just add about the competition. There's a beautiful uh, uh, video. It's a very, you find the shortest one to listen. It's called Blue Mountain, I'm sorry, Blue Ocean Marketing. So they talk about the red ocean is competition. It's like we have to fight each other. We have to kill each other. We have to take your, you know, um, we have to take your business away to take, get our business. But there's a blue ocean strategy, which it's the why blue ocean when you live in creation and that there's enough for everyone. And when you can just shift to that concept of, you know, so say as a midwife, as a doula, as a birth worker, I might just work with women who, you know, um, have been, you know, abused in their life. And that might be my special little facet of the diamond. So I like to just encourage people that we all are facets of this diamond. And once you have the whole diamond, it's not going to take just one spot that's all the same to fix everything. We all facets of the diamond. There is no competition. And that um, once you can get that idea across to people, we move into creation instead of competition. Beautiful. In terms of the doula, we used to have uh, doulas at a local hospital here until the anesthesiologist complained that his income was going down. And so they got rid of the doulas. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. money making for you. So I put in the uh, chat over here, Darsha has spoken a couple of times at the maternal gift economy uh, salons that they have. So there's a link in there where you can hear about um, the maternal gift economy. We're talking about that. And also just wanted to say we're sitting here right now because in Virginia, 27 years ago, exactly the model that Barbara described is how this nonprofit got started. It was a it was a combination of Joseph Chilton Pierce was down the road in Charlottesville and he wrote the book The Magical Magical Child and a group of parents uh, seven hundred families in Virginia that were using this underground midwife formed their underground community to study Joseph Chilton Pierce's work and to give each other help because the midwife said to them I, I, the in the in the model you know completely opposite of medical models she said i cannot be your go-to for everything you have to have meetings you have to share what you know with each other and you have to help each other with your families and, and on this path of health and wellness and this is truly why we're sitting here today and i'll put our history up in the chat if you're interested in that and everything we've done in 27 years by the way this is a nonprofit, and please support us support darsha <laughs> thank you Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Daniel, and then Rachel, Rochelle. Awesome. Real nice to be here. I I came through to your work through uh, reading, uh, she's a therapist out here on the West Coast, uh, Sharon Stanley, and her, her work was really good at communicating kind of the importance of, of supportive communities and, and how we work through our challenges, you know, in life in in various ways but it's that uh kind of the attunement and uh resonance i guess hard to put into words right simply but um it was really but she she uh referenced your work a lot 
about creating supportive communities that are emotionally attuned and uh and how that's kind of like a a kernel for for getting us out of uh uh moving us to a better place i guess but the 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 conversation about the um the challenges like in society you know working in a in a capitalist system that uh makes it hard to build these kind of um evolved nests you know in in different ways that that is that has been on my mind and 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 i'm curious about ways people have um been figuring that out like i think about uh urban agriculture movements how you might have a a lot somewhere and you're growing food but then say a developer decides finally to develop that land or the effects of gentrification when you're creating you've got a cool community that's growing and then it gets popular and then homes start getting bought up or just the ability for map money to to really um get at the commons you know continually and so i'm uh yeah just curious ways to or examples of of how folks have organized like in in neighborhoods or communities i'm I remember reading up a bit in this, these communities in northern Syria, how they created really a bottom-up democratic uh, system, uh, this uh, area called Rojava, in the middle of so much chaos, but it was really kind of like a bottom-up um, direct democracy that they created and how, like just thinking of those structures of of organizing that kind of push back at, at uh, kind of the, the power of individuals say with money or or you know the big the big people on top with their ability to kind of change things anyways i'm just curious about other uh other examples of of uh neighborhoods or models or something where you can organize to help um uh support you know these more interpersonal and developmental kind of nests that are that we're trying to foster Gosh, that's this is early in the morning for me. Well, kind of outside. <laughs> a little foggy. Need a coffee. But uh, anyways, wanted to put that out there. Oh, thank you. Yeah, a lot of good ideas that you brought up yourself, right? Um, that you've been um, reading about. Uh, that the community organizing is not my area, right? I'm I'm the academic trying to pull together all the information about what's gone wrong with humanity and how to how to get back on track but yeah. the organizing part is is a really important as uh the next step so i uh i think we can you know advocate for parks in our neighborhoods if you're in a city to uh take down or uh, eliminate the ordinances that uh that um criminalize children outside playing alone <laughs> uh playing alone in a park or you know outside there without adult supervision those those their things are kind of nuts um <clears throat> and uh taking away the laws that don't let you have more than two generations in a household for example there's all sorts of rules that have been put in place to emphasize the nuclear family rather than the extended family to emphasize cars instead of walking and mass transport. So there's, I think each person, each uh, group of people from a particular locale will have to examine what's needed in where they are, <clears throat> where to start and what their skills are. So um, <clears throat> bringing back the doulas, right? And midwives, there's uh, quite a bit of effort now on that. And um if we had single payer government paid health care like European countries do, it would be so much easier because the government wants you to be healthy. But our incentives are you make more money, the insurance companies, everybody else, if you're sick. <laughs> the pharmaceuticals make a lot of money. <laughs> Therapists too, right? So uh, the incentives are all backwards in our in the United States. Uh <clears throat> So we have to get politic, money out of politics, for example, but we have a Supreme Court that is kind of very extremely arist arist well, oligarchical, <laughs> wants the powerful, the rich to be in charge. 
the way they, they act. So uh, we have a lot of barriers in the States, but other countries, you know, um, I maybe have more freedom to do things than we do here. So I'm hoping that <clears throat> the global South, which still has a lot of wisdom that we haven't lost, at least the non-elites, um, may be the leaders for us in the future. Uh, we can't look to places like the U.S. to be a leader because it's so caught up in corruption, moneyed corruption in oligarchy. So um, it's not oriented to our well-being. But other countries have a better. Poland just uh, pushed out a populist and want to get back to de democratic rule. So that's hopeful. So anyway, there's so many levels and layers, right? So start where you are. Do what you can <clears throat> with the gifts you have. Absolutely. Thanks, Daniel. So I'd like to say something to yeah. what's happening here, and uh, is, uh, and I've written about this in Kindred. I'll throw this up on the in our chat in just a second. I'm Kindred's editor. I'm the co-founder of Kindred World. I've been here for this entire journey, and you can read about all of that on Kindred and our Wisdom Archives. Hmm. And what it, what I perceive the extraordinary. Uh, integrative synthesizing work that Darsha has brought to us with this evolved nest is uh, the lens that I heard and I hear all of you saying this is the lens that I see through so it's like our worldview is already here and perceiving our child children ourselves are wanting to as whole but we don't see that reflected back to us culturally and like Darsha said evolution doesn't make mistakes cultures do so this is a cultural transformation issue that we have to uh, take on now, which means, as Joseph Chilton Pierce wrote in his work, the culture is what uh, internally what we reflect out there, and then if we forget that's where it's coming from, and then we're, we the the cycle gets uh, that oh now we're absorbing and internalizing these cultural biases and he called it the biocultural conflict and if you read our history you can see this has been our mission from the beginning is to redress this biocultural conflict but one of the most important pieces of the evolvedness that darsha talks about if you somebody was mentioning uh restoring the kinship worldview is to be aware that we are shifting our worldview right now and in this uh the uh, article i'm getting ready to put up what i talk about is it is up to us to understand what worldview, where we are in this process, because when we start shifting ourselves, then what we're just talking about, oh, this resource is here and these people are there and these people have figured it out there. We grow the eyes and ears to perceive that this new way of being is already emerging, the new old way. Our evolutionary imperatives are coming, are being brought back into the center of our human consciousness right now. So I just I appreciate um, this discussion, but I want to frame it and, and and not feel like it's nebulous. It, there is um, a discussion that's been going on for a long time at Kindred, uh, and I invite you to come on over to our Muddy Networks platform as well if you're not there, so you can be a part of that. Thank you, Lisa. So Rochelle and then Linda Hamilton. Hi, Darsha and everyone else. Thank you so much for your work. Um, I don't even know how I came across you. It was a couple of years ago, but it was on YouTube. But um, probably as I was doing a Google on uh, Jean Leadloff. So I discovered her book before I had my first child 36 years ago. Mm -hmm. It remains to date my favorite like go-to book or the one that I refer people to as well as my name is Chellis and I'm rec in recovery from Western civilization. Um, but I wanted to share some of my own personal experience because for me, reading those things was like, well, of course, like it's just also common sense. And I was very fortunate to at least have um, a few women around me who were raising their children at the same time, who were the same ages, and we all shared the same viewpoint. And we all, you know, we all had midwives before they were even kind of like, whatever, certified, which actually was the kind I prefer, but uh, be before it became mainstream, I would say. And, you know, family bed, homeschool, 
And I ended up uh, moving out to the West Coast in BC and living in a housing co-op where there were four other homeschool families and kids would be running around. And uh, to me, they were just having the greatest time. So I'm just going to fast forward now because I'm a grandparent. I have two children, uh, two grandchildren, seven and five. And one of the things I look back on and I that I find so despairing is that, sure, I did what I could. We did what we could collectively. But the the magnitude of the culture and the sickness of the culture, I just don't know how to and manage that. So and with many of those people who I've had contact with, those kids who are now adults and have their own kids are now looking at their parents and saying, why did you homeschool us? How come, you know, there's a lot of accusation that actually happens. You would think <laughs> that giving your children these things would be like the wonderful thing, but it turns out, you know, my my grandkids were raised uh, or have cribs uh, when they were young. Like it just didn't transmit. It didn't carry forward. And I feel a lot of distress around that. Yeah. Did I do something wrong? You know that. So I'm bringing a little maternal guilt here, which I don't recommend. Um and I've spent my entire life, I'll just say, teaching nonviolent communication because the 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 thrust towards connection, I just see that we've been raised in a dis a state of disconnection. So it's I'm I'm just trying to figure out oh what next. It's so heavy. It's such a burden. And I have a lot of young female friends who are now where I was some 20 years ago with their kids, like, oh, he's going to school. I don't know if he should get the vaccine. I, you know, all, all of these dilemmas that people who have big questions and big concerns and want to live relationally feel so lonely and isolated, even in the midst of having a lot of people around them. And I saw a mention of grief work in there. I've definitely been doing that for quite a while. So I, I, I don't know why I'm bringing it forward and my heart is racing. I just feel like it's important. And I think the work you're doing is the most important work in the world. And I don't think, I guess I'm worried because I see what's happening. I see the growing rate of family estrangements, um, the gender dysphoria. I just think, oh, so much disconnection. I, I want to find a way to not buckle under it, you know? So that's... But yeah, my bleeding all over the place here. <laughs> yeah. But I still think those are the best books and now yours along with it. And um, yeah, I don't have any optimism, but I keep doing it. Well, I would like to say to you, is your name Rochelle? It's Rochelle, yeah. Rochelle. Um, as a mother, um, I, I wish I could lift that burden of guilt that was placed on you culturally. Uh, and I, I would like to be able to do that. Um, you were let down and none of that is anything that you should be bearing. We were all let down by cultural bias, cultural, and, and Darsha's work covers all of this, which is why the world view issue is so important. And to the degree that we're still letting mothers down by uh, peddling the narrative that mothers are supposed to be able to do all this in isolation, right now in the United States, uh, the leading cause of death for new mothers is suicide. Do we talk about that? Are we talking about that? You know, we just we just made forced birth a reality in in America for for mothers that don't have resources to have children here, like other developed nations. And I'll let Darsha speak to you about uh, the Allo Mother piece, which I did put here in the uh, chat uh, about how we're not supposed to do this alone, and it does have the statistics there at the top about uh, new motherhood in the United States. I'm um, I'm very sorry. Um, I really am. I really wish that all of us could just get not suffer like this. Um, it's it was an engineered suffering. We should have never borne it. Can I just add one thing? Is that I 
my, uh, you know, I mentioned mother guilt and I, and clearly I have a lot of emotion around this, but really what's uh, the, the biggest uh, grief that I have is around children is mm -hmm. that um, I, I just, I do too much research in areas I think I shouldn't go or I don't have the stomach for um, because the level of polarization I see is only increasing and and because of the work that I do, and I work one-on-one -on -one with people as well as group work, um, I just see things getting worse. And I think that people are want something, but they don't want to do what it takes. Like to say to someone, well, you know, how about giving up a salary, for instance? That's that's a very important thing. How about wanting less? How about not insisting on having the extra bathroom in your home? How about not insisting on the second car? Like it's it's a lifestyle uh, change that's required. And I'm not sure it's so hard when people get accustomed to something, you know, I don't know if you've heard, heard the quote from Upton Sinclair, it's hard to get a person, uh, it's hard to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. And I would just insert the word uh, lifestyle in there, because this is so lifestyle driven to the conveniences that we have, that they're so hard to give up. But the kids are worth it, I think. And that's, I, I, I'm, yeah, thanks for letting me add that piece because that is my heartbreak. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rochelle, <clears throat> for expressing um, feelings and, and thoughts that many of us have had about how things are going in the wrong direction and the disconnect between the generations, which is distressing. Um, in our ancestral context, nomadic foragers, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the uh, elders are the ones that take care of the younger children. And it's the 20 to 40 year olds that are all about working and getting their, you know, they're focused on their identity and they're kind of uh, making a contribution through their activities to the world. But the elders, you know, are past that and they, they're more in tune with the unmanifest the the other realms of of the universe just like the youngest children are till about seven or eight years old um and so they get along really well and that nurturing is something that is so critical now i think that <clears throat> between 20 and 40 i think uh children are often not well i guess it starts earlier in adolescence not all that grateful for their parents <laughs> Um, because they, you know, whatever they see other in, in our culture, uh, see other possibilities for them. So my <clears throat> uh, prediction is that once they reach their 50s or 60s, they're going to be so grateful to you <clears throat> that they will have realized how important it was uh, the way that you nurtured them in contrast to what the dominant culture keeps telling us is more important. So uh, anyway, that's my prediction. You'll have to let me know <laughs> about that. Meanwhile, <clears throat> yeah, what to do when uh, people are emailing regularly to me about their grandchildren being sleep trained and things like that by their children, and they're so distressed about it. It's really hard to deal with those things um, because you, if you get too... Um, say too much you can lose the relationship they'll cut you off potentially so i think what what we can do is what uh tom was talking about earlier and that is provide that space that nurturing space for the children so that when they're with you they have that feeling of comfort and cuddly um love rather than the the demands and the competition and the the restrictions that their parents are putting on them as well as their peers in school, et cetera. <clears throat> but <clears throat> we, we are in a space where things seem to be getting worse before they get better. So I think we need, uh, and, and perhaps that's what's needed to wake everyone up. <clears throat> things, uh, w when an idea takes, takes um, <clears throat> flight and, and uh, invades or, uh, kind of latches on to everybody. It's a viral moment. It can be a viral moment. And what we need with the Evolved Nest is a viral uh, expansion of the idea and how important it is for all of us to be nested, not just children. 
right? We all need cuddling and we all need nature immersion and connection. We all need responsive relationships, mentors. We all need uh, lots of play. So um, I think when we attune into ourselves, at least that's the very least we can do is nest ourselves. Then we can be more <clears throat> prepared for whatever we face. Whoever we meet, we can be uh, loving instead of defensive against whatever they present. Darsha, I just want to add to, as a social media person, <laughs> I've yeah. seen, you know, in the past, my son is 21 and I really got into this while I was pregnant. <clears throat> There's been an incredible difference in what you can find on social media. They're, uh, they're like in the past, like you'd have to really go looking and you'd find mothering.com. That was the only place you could really find it in the chat groups. And then you were considered odd. But nowadays you find it all like Instagram and there's pictures, there's visuals, there's videos, there's these beautiful images uh, and they're all over the place. And one big change I saw in the past, I think it's like five years they had the diapers commercial where the baby went skin to skin. When I saw that, it, I like, I almost um, lost my mind. Cause I'm like, oh, finally, like they're showing skin to skin in a diaper mainstream commercial. So it is happening. Don't feel so sad. I see it looks, it's a big mess on the top, like a, like a pus or something, but underneath are these firm, incredible women and families who are choosing something different. And there's so many resources and images and things for people to find. So I really feel like all you people who are studying this, you're ready, you're ready, you're ready. And this is the time that people are going to start looking because they're starting to see that the medical paradigm industrial complex doesn't hold everything. So just don't be so sad. <clears throat> it's happening. It's beautiful. And, you know, you want to do something, go share something beautiful, you know, everywhere on your walls you can reach people beyond what their social reach is. So don't discount what one share a day can do. You know, that's all. Brilliant. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Um, Linda. Uh, you're going to unmute. <clears throat> Our time is almost up too. But... Okay. How's that? Yep. Okay, great. I'm so happy to be here and I just want to add on to that this this we're living in a transitional time and it's that's that's a messy that can be a messy time so Raquel I I really feel I feel exactly what you're feeling as well I have seven children and I've tried my best to do all the things I home birth homeschool um, moved my family to the jungles of Costa Rica to get them out of the U.S. Um, I breastfed my last child till she was eight. <laughs> oh, Woo. which is really wonderful. And um, Darsha, I really appreciate all of your research and everything you have to offer. It's it's been such an inspiration to me in my work as a birth keeper, um, midwife, doula. I prefer to call myself a birth keeper. And I work with my clients, really try to stress the importance of the prenatal life. And uh, so your work has been really, um, yes, just so inspirational. I just, I'm very excited and happy to be here. I wanted to thank you for that. Um, I, I see it too with uh, what I wanted to say about that is these What's happening now, not just with the parents, but with the babies, I feel like these babies are giving information to their mothers. And it's different. I've been doing this work for 30 years. The kids that are coming now, these babies that are coming now are different. And they to the point where some of my clients, including myself, I had this experience as well, where I saw the place of the birth, where the baby needed to be born. And I had no idea where it was or how I would get there or anything. And then it would all come together. And I almost feel like these babies are coming to um, what would be similar to like a pressure point on the planet and that they don't even have to do anything. They just have to come and to be, to arrive on those points. And I, I don't know. I'm, I don't have all of this solidified yet. I'm still in, I guess I would say I'm in a state of mystery right now, but
but I can definitely say that from what I've seen in my work, um, that things are changing. I see the shift. I feel the shift. Um, and in any labor transition is a very difficult time. And that's always when the mother looks at me and says, I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. And my response is always awesome because you're in it now. <laughs> the fact that you're saying this means that baby's almost here. And I see that for humanity now. We're in transition. It's difficult. It's messy. There's poop and blood and sweat and tears. <laughs> But we can't lose hope. We have to understand that the beauty and the bliss is really very close and to just keep doing what we're all doing right now. And just thank you again, Darsha, for all of the, all that you've done. Well, thank you, Linda. You're giving me chills. You're <laughs> what you said. Oh, so such a promising note to end on here. It's just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. was Danny raising her hand? Danny, were you raising your hand or you're just waving? Okay. <laughs> oh, I was just waving. And come, thank you so hey. much for this share, Linda. <laughs> thank you. There are things in the chat, um, but our time is up. I think one thing, um, so you'll be sent the chat afterwards, so you don't have to scroll through it right now. But there was a mention of needing to do grief work, right? I think that's true. We uh, Let's see, where is that? Um, Mullen was saying that, like the work of Joanna Macy, Francis Keller, Stephen Jenkinson, uh, we need to grieve together. And our culture doesn't like that, at least in the United States. And since the Protestant Re Reformation, they kind of shut down all this, the community grieving uh, rituals. Um, so we need to return to that and have some times where we grieve. I know I, I cry almost every day um, on my own, but it'd be nice to have a group where you know you can come and share and light a candle uh offer tobacco or um pass uh incense and be in communion together grieving so if there's ways for us to do that it's kind of hard over zoom but um thank you for the optimism and for the uh struggles that you shared today i think we all are on a on the page together we're all on this in the same river, right? Joined together, swimming together. We're not alone. Let's remember that. Our hearts are connected. Why don't you take a deep breath right now and feel, feel the connection among us and feel energized by that. Let it melt your fear away, melt your resentment, anger, Whatever's in the way of that flow of loving divine energy that keeps the world going, uh, well, let's tap into that and share it now as we go forward this week in the next minutes, hours, days, months. Thank you so much for coming. Peace and power be with you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Darsha. Thank you so much. Have a nice day, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. The chat, the chat will be sent, right, Darsha? You said that. Yes. yes. I unmuted everyone in case they just want to say goodbye oh, okay. on the way out. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Hey, bye, Patricia. <laughs> see you, Patricia. Peter. Glad you got to come. It's nice to meet bye. you, Tom. Yeah. Bye. Megan, bye. bye. Jan, bye.